every single day that shows what they have generated for the city of Detroit. But the bottom line is they're no different from that dry cleaner or that hardware store. They're in business to make money. And frankly, even they're not making as much as they used to. You know, th this economy has shown that even casinos are not recession proof. Their profits and their revenues are actually down. And the danger becomes if you start trying to go back to them and say, well, we need more, we need more, are you maybe cutting your nose to spite your face? I think we got to think about that. I'm not trying to get you into the politics of gambling, but the question is, are, are you satisfied where things are as far as the casinos are concerned? Does, is the mayor of, of Detroit satisfied? Am I satisfied with yeah. casinos? Yeah. But where I mean, we in terms of in the terms percentage of, what of what money that we're getting right. from them or what? Yes. They put a lot into the city of Detroit. I would be happier if it hadn't been such a wash. And what I mean by that is the casinos have definitely benefited the city financially. And frankly, if we didn't have these three casinos, we would probably be in much worse shape. But part of the reason why it hasn't really been the huge windfall that I think a lot of folks were looking for it to be is because we were being cut in so many other areas at the same time that the casinos were coming online that while, yes, the money that they bring into the city of Detroit is useful, at the same time, when we're getting cut in revenue sharing and you had other companies that were moving out of the city of Detroit, it ended up almost on a certain level kind of being more of a stabilizer than something that actually put us ahead, if that makes sense. All right, thanks, Mayor Cockrell, for that. Uh, you're listening to a mayoral town hall meeting with Ken Cockrell, Jr. from Wayne State University, broadcasting live on WDET. We have been collecting questions from the audience throughout the meeting so far, and uh, we would like to ask you a few of those now, if that's okay, Mr. Sure. Mayor. The first question says, you have said in the past that you didn't really know how bad the city's deficit was when you became mayor, uh, but why is that the case when you were president of city council? Because they weren't, the former mayor wasn't exactly truthful with us on what the numbers really were. I mean, let's be honest, he wasn't truthful with us on a couple of different, and I'm not ripping on him because I kind of, at a certain point in my administration, adopted a policy of saying, I'm not going to keep dumping on Kwame Kilpatrick because whatever problems he left behind, at this point, they're my problems. But in response to that question, I have to say, they were not forthcoming in what the true state of the budget was. And that's part of the reason why, after we got in office, started peeling back the layers, so to speak, and took a look at the true state of the city's books, we were the ones who determined where we were really at. Are you suggesting that there was anything illegal about the way the books were being kept during the Kilpatrick administration? I don't know if it was so much a case of people hiding numbers or maybe just not even not having the capacity to really prepare them in the right way. I mean, when I took office, one of the first things that I had to do was actually complete a comprehensive annual, not me personally, but, you know, our team, uh, a comprehensive annual financial report, which is mandated by the state. These are reports that have to be turned in at the conclusion of every single fiscal year. When I took office, the 2007 comprehensive annual financial report was 18 months late. It had not been done, even though I took office in September of 2008. So that was one of the first tasks that we actually had to complete. And the fact that that wasn't done is actually part of the reason why the books were a bit of a shambles. All right, let's move on to the next one. Uh, this is uh, from Lance, I believe, who says, over the past seven months, what would you have done differently as mayor? What would I have done differently over the course of the past seven months? It's a very good question. Well, obviously, the one thing which we kind of talked about earlier is relative to the Kobo issue, as I said. And again, I was involved in dealing with council. In retrospect, I probably would have been even more involved personally with council. I mean, you can't babysit them. I can't call up all nine council members every single day. Are you okay with this? Are you okay? I can't do that. I don't have the time to do that because this is a tremendously demanding job. But there are certain things that I would have done. So. Uh, getting to the demanding job part, yeah. this next question says, with all of the problems that you're dealing with and with all that you could choose to do with your life, why, are you, why do you want to run the city of Detroit? Because I'm a sucker for punishment. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, love this, I love this city. I mean, I, I love this city, and I feel I bring something to the table, and I'm, I want to work with the people of this city to, to try to move us forward. Oh, well, going back to the, the former mayor, do you know how many of the former mayor's staff are still working for you and why? And if I had to boil it down to an exact number, I probably couldn't do that in terms of why. They're there because I'm not going to treat people with, from the standpoint of 
oh, you used to work for him. You got to go. You're tainted. I mean, that, I don't think that's a good way to deal with folks, and I think it's unfair to paint people with that brush. I mean, and that question has been put to me a lot. I mean, a lot of people say, why do you still have some of these Kilpatrick appointees working for him? Well, you know, at the end of the day, I don't think it's about whether or not somebody's a Cockrell appointee or a Kilpatrick appointee or Archer appointee or a Coleman Young appointee, because some, some of those folks that were working with Coleman Young, believe it or not, are actually still with the city to this day. At the end of the day, we all work for the city of Detroit, and that ought to be the goal. And I, I kind of look at it from a military perspective. If you've got good people who are prepared to stand up and say, the old general's gone, you're the new general, I'm prepared to follow you and help you lead the city where you think it needs to go. If you have people that are willing to stand up and do that, why wouldn't you give them a shot? Why kick them out the door just because of who they used to work for? Well, let's move on to the issue of the crime lab, the decision to shut down the city's crime lab and the backlog that that's created at other crime labs in the state. What is your plan moving forward to get this up and running in the city of Detroit and relieve some of that backlog and also address some of those cases that may be unhinged because of the crime lab errors? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very good question, and I know there's been a lot of stuff in the media about a war between me and the prosecutor. I actually talked to the Wayne County prosecutor this morning to just clear the air on a couple things relative to this, and we had a very positive conversation. So, But first thing is that the decision to actually close down the crime lab was actually my decision, uh, and it was something that we did because we recognize, based on the findings in a Michigan State Police Department audit, in one area of the crime lab that specifically dealt with the handling of firearms, that there was a major problem. That there was a major problem and that it was a reason to believe that that problem transcended not only how the firearms were being dealt with, <coughs> but also other areas of the crime lab. So I made the decision to shut the crime lab down with the understanding and based on conversations that we were having, not only with the Wayne County prosecutor, but also with the Michigan State Police. Our plan is to basically transition that work to the Michigan State Police and let them handle it in the same way that they deal with all the other cities in Michigan. Because Detroit actually was the only city in Michigan that operated its own crime lab. In fact, I don't know if this is true, but someone told me the other day, and I've got to check it out, that there may not even be any other major cities in the country that are running their own crime lab. So, but I've got to double check that. So the plan is to actually kick that to the Michigan <coughs> State Police and let them process that work. We have already had discussions and already have an agreement with the Michigan State Police where they will absorb the majority of the employees from the crime lab into the Michigan State Police. So it's not, it should not result in much job loss. And also as it relates to the prosecutor and the funds that she has requested to handle any cases that may be appealed as a result of this, we're prepared actually to work with the prosecutor on that. The only thing that's kept us from cutting that check is we just need to see a detailed budget so that we know exactly what it is we're paying for. There's also a possibility based on a grant application that we have submitted to the federal government that we may be able to get federal funds that would basically finance the unit that the Wayne Pro County prosecutor uh, wants to create to deal with any cases that may be appealed as a result of the issues in the crime lab. Just a follow-up, so you would support a review of uh, convictions associated with that crime lab? Oh, absolutely. That, absolutely. I think that's perfectly fair. And if I was an attorney representing someone who was convicted as a result of evidence that was processed through that crime lab, and I had reason to believe that maybe some of that evidence was mishandled, absolutely I would appeal. I think that is the right of anybody, and I support it. We've got another question here. This is in regards to uh, food issues. This person says, as a student who lives on Wayne's campus, I've had difficulty finding affordable food. Many residents are forced to do their shopping outside of the city. What will you do to bring in affordable and healthy food to the city, and how will you help to combat Detroit's obesity problem? Hmm. Very good question. Very good question. And as somebody who actually just lives a couple blocks away from here, I can relate to that. I mean, I know that the the University Foods, the grocery store is right over there, and I do do a lot of shopping. Other than that, as far as grocery stores, we really don't have too much around here other than University Foods. We've had some nice restaurants, of course, that have popped up over the years, but if you just want to do basic grocery shopping, I realize that options are limited. We do have something that we have launched through our Detroit Economic Growth Corporation called the uh, Grocery Initiative which is actually headed up by a young woman named Olga Starr. 
and one of the focuses of that